uh, this lecture. Center for the Promotion of Science uh, wanted to symbolically mark the International Women's Day through a lecture by Dr. Pauline Gagnon. Uh, Dr. Pauline is a Canadian physicist who has been dealing with the position of women in science, their scientific contribution and challenges. And she also found her inspiration in her work in our scientist Mileva Maric Einstein. Through her work, she highlights the importance of the popularization of science, the presence of women in science, and reveals the extent of sexism and homophobia in scientific community. Dr. Pauline was a CERN science communicator until 2014. She published the book, What the Higgs Boson Eats in Winter, and other important details, uh, which has been translated in six languages. Explaining particle physics in simple, understandable uh, terms is her trademark. So tonight we'll have the opportunity to hear in simple terms how the discovery of Higgs boson completed the current theoretical mod model that perfectly describes visible matter, that is everything we see here on Earth, but it fails to include dark matter, a mysterious form of matter five times more abundant than regular matter, but still totally unknown. Physicists are currently searching for new particles and a more comprehensive theory that would go beyond the current model to explain what dark matter might be. Dr. Pauline will also discuss the huge impact basic research on particle physics has had in our lives. So before you start, Dr. Pauline, I would like to say hi to all of our associates and colleagues from uh, science clubs and makerspaces who are currently following us through streaming. Dr. Pauline, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, invitation here tonight. I think I won't use the microphone because there was a lot of echo and I think it will be easier like this. Um, I want to thank first uh, the uh, Canadian Institute, uh, Canadian Institute, the Canadian Embassy, I'm a little tired, it's been a long week, but uh, for bringing me here to Serbia in the midst of the month of uh, Francophonie. So you see now, uh, the bilingualism from Canada in action. So last night I gave uh, some talks in uh, French and today it's going to be in English. So I'm going to talk about particle physics and I hope you will agree with me that it can be uh, made understandable. So the, whoops, uh, particle physics, I, I'll start by explaining roughly what particle physics is about. Then I will talk about the Higgs boson. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about it, but I don't think all of you could describe what it is. It's not very well understood. And then I will uh, explain why do we bother to look for all those particles and what is left to do. And so the purpose of particle physics is to find the smallest building blocks of matter. And so we want to find what are the smallest grains of matter that exist. And we know that there are atoms because we've been told so in, uh, in school, but it's difficult to see them. If we were in Copenhagen, Copenhagen is uh, where the Lego bricks were invented. And so they have Lego land there where everything is made of Lego bricks. And so when nobody is looking, I could take one of those exhibits, break it apart, and then I would see, uh, I would see all the pieces coming out, and those would be the fundamental particles in the world of Legolands. It's the, exactly the same with real matter. All matter is made of essentially a handful of different bricks, and with them we can build everything we see here on Earth as well as in all stars and galaxies. So, you will see that it's even simpler than Lego. Lego bricks, there are 3,700 different bricks now, but in particle physics, we only have 18, so it's not so bad. So the smallest building blocks of matter, it's difficult because atoms are so small, we don't see them like Lego bricks, which makes it easy. But you know that matter is made of atoms, and atoms of, uh, there's something, mm -hmm. Whoop. Oh. Okay, 
So the atoms are really small. Here is a real picture of an atom that I saw on uh, someone's computer, a physicist, a computer. She showed me uh, what she was doing. They were in a building like they are building at a Biosense in uh, Novisat, a building that is built on uh, rubber uh, uh, legs such that it has absolutely no vibration so they can measure nanometers, really small things. So she had a picture of... Uh, a real um, atom. An atom is a million times smaller than a hair. So it's really small. If I put it in the scientific notation, it's 10 to the minus 10 meters. It means I take the decimal point, the decimal point is normally there, and I move it 10 times, and uh, the decimal point was here, I move it 10 times, and I get this number. So this is a nice, simple way to express large or small numbers. So that's the size of an atom. If I was the nucleus that we see here at the center, and there were electrons around me, my electrons would be 20 kilometers away. At my uh, size, my electrons would be 20 kilometers away. So mostly an atom is completely empty. And it's only repulsive forces between electrons of my shoes and the electrons of uh, the floor the repulsive electric force there that make it that I don't go through the floor. But everything is completely empty. Okay? And uh, that's difficult. Inside here, so the atom is not uh, fundamental because it's made of other things. Inside here, we have the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, we have neutrons and protons. The neutrons and protons are 10,000 times smaller than the, the atom. And inside protons and neutrons, we find quarks. We find three quarks in each of them. So if I ask you here, and don't be shy, if I ask you here, what are the only particles that we have here that we cannot break any smaller? Quarks, quarks very good. And? Come on, the elect electronic engineer, ele electric engineers, the electron. <laughs> we, we forget here because we keep breaking down. But so the electron and uh, the quarks are the only fundamental particles. And then I'll show you if I take, it, uh, I need up quarks and down quarks, two different types of quarks. Up quarks have a positive charge of two-thirds, so two-thirds of the charge of an electron, which is one, minus one, but positive, and down quarks have a charge, electric charge of minus one-third. And if I take two up quarks, that's as much math as we will do, do here, sorry for you, so two-thirds plus two-thirds with two up quarks, minus one-third for the down quark, and we get a positively, positively charged proton. And then if I want to make a neutron, a, neut a neutral particle, what can, with quarks, three quarks, up and down quarks, how do I get that? I think that's it. So we can do it with one up quark and two down quarks, and we get a neutral particle. Okay, so with up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, I can make protons and neutrons, and then I can make, whoops, I can make all the chemical elements that we have in the, in the periodic table. Because to make that, we, to make hydrogen, for example, all I need is a, a remote that works. So to make hydrogen, I need one proton, and there is no neutron in it, in the nucleus here. And you put one proton and you put one electron around. And an atom is neutral. Then when I move to the next one, helium, there I need two protons. When you add one proton, you change the nature of the chemical element. And then here I need two neutrons to make it uh, stable. I'll explain that a bit better later. Lithium, three protons and three neutrons. And you see that for lithium here, it's uh, the atomic mass is six, because it has six what we call nucleons. 
Neutrons and protons are both called nucleons because we find them in the nucleus. And likewise, beryllium, four protons and five neutrons. So the number of neutrons is not easy to predict. It, de it depends on uh, to make something that is stable, and I will explain it later. So now we have a model that is called the standard model that explains what are the basic fundamental particles. And it has two principles, so it's quite simple. The first principle, all matter is made of fundamental particles. Just like at Legoland, everything is built out of uh, Lego bricks. Here, everything is built out of leptons. That's a family that, com that com uh, contains the electron. And another family that will, uh, the quarks, when you mix them together, you get a type of family that we call hadrons, like the protons and the neutrons are hadrons because they're made of quarks. So we have six. Uh, leptons, the name was uh, from the uh, Greek, lepton to say uh, light. The electron is quite light indeed, uh, but uh, the muon is just like an electron, but 200 times uh, heavier. And the tau here is 4,000 times heavier, but they're the same. They have a, a charge of minus one, and each of them comes with a different uh, neutrino. Now, I'm representing the particles here with uh, little uh, stuffed animals that comes from the particle zoo. A young woman who was a seamstress, she worked as a sewing clothes and all that. She had attended a lecture like this and she thought it was so funny, all those particles, she decided to make them. And you should really order a box, a universe in a box. You can get that for hundreds, some euro or something. But it's really nice because then the kids can mix all the particles and all my colleagues who have uh, tiny kids, the kids all know how uh, quarks work and all that, it's really nice. So we have the leptons, and the leptons don't mix together. You cannot form a composite object with two leptons. That doesn't happen. But the quarks, as we have seen, we can build protons and neutrons with three quarks. We can also uh, build other particles that are called mesons with one quark and one antiquark. Because all these particles also have their antiparticle. But we won't really talk about anti-matter uh, right now, but it's, it's there. So you can, uh, we have the up quark and down quark, you've met them. The next one that was discovered is the strange quark, and it got this name because it had a strange lifetime. Though all particles that had a uh, strange quark lived much longer than neutrons or protons and all the, all the other, uh, pions and kaons. So that was, the reason why they gave it that name, strange. And the next one was found in, someone said, why not charm? And then the, uh, it came with uh, beauty and truth, but then people decided, oh, no, that's too silly, we'll name them top and bottom. The top quark is the heaviest particle of all. It's 174 GeV, which is an unit and energy, but I'll explain that also later. So it's about 175 times heavier than a proton. It's a massive object. The weirdest thing is that uh, to build all ordinary matter that we see here with protons, neutrons, atoms, we only need the first row, which we call the first generation. The second and third generation of particles, we don't need them. We find them sometimes in cosmic rays, but normally they don't exist. We can produce them in the lab, and we've done that countless times. Sometimes in very energetic collisions in, the, in outer space, you can produce them as well, but normally they're not there, so they're absolutely useless. And so the, the, the mass difference is a puzzle. It's like I give you a construction set for Christmas time, and you know you, you want to assemble them, but you have small Lego bricks big like this, and then Duplo that are really big for tiny kids, and then huge ones like this. And you have uh, sketch, no, sch schematic drawings telling you how to make a, a car or a Sputnik or I don't know what. And, but you never use most of the parts that are there. So it's, it's a strange construction set. We have no idea why these particles are there. They're not needed. 
So the standard model tells us all matter is made of fundamental particles and the way they interact with each other is by exchanging particles that we call bosons. Bosons, huh? you've heard the name before. Bosons are associated to forces. And this, there are several of them. There are, in fact, five forces, fundamental forces, acting on uh, elementary particles, like the strong interaction, which is what binds two quarks together or three quarks together inside a proton. And then it's mediated by the gluons. And then there are photons, and those are massless. Photon is also massless, and that's associated with light. Okay, and that's the photoelectric effect that uh, Mileva and uh, Mileva Maric and Albert Einstein found. That was uh, their discovery. And then the W and the Z boson are associated with the weak interaction, which is the type of interaction that takes place on the sun, and that's how it burns its energy and keeps us from uh, freezing here. Recently, about 10 years ago, gravitational waves were found, and for every wave associated with those forces, we always have found a particle. So we expect the graviton, but it hasn't been found yet. And finally, the Higgs boson, which also comes with a new uh, uh, forces coming with the broad and Higgs field. Okay, to better ex uh, uh, explain this exchange of a particle, let, let me uh, illustrate it here with two, like uh, two particles, it's two little skaters, and they're going on their own trajectory, and they don't know that the other one is there, but when one comes here and she tosses a heavy ball to the other one, and it makes the second one deviate, and the first one also recoils, like when you shoot a gun and you feel the, the recoil, so if you're looking from far away, you think, oh, there was a mysterious interaction between the two of them. Man, no, no, no. They have exchanged a particle. They have exchanged a boson, and that's why they modify their behavior. So those are the two principles of the standard model. Everything is made of fundamental particles, and they exchange, uh, they interact with each other by exchanging other particles called bosons. In the 60s or 70s, there were about, two, uh, today at least, there are 230 particles that have been observed, or we thought they were kind of fundamental. And they're listed in this little booklet that physicists use to carry all the time in their pocket with all the properties of the particles. And it was a complete mystery. What is this? What is this zoo of uh, particles? And now we understand that the standard, the, Thanks to the standard model, we know it's very simple. There are 18 elementary particles, and uh, all of the, most of those particles, so 230 minus 18, are the 212 hadrons, particles made of assembly, uh, uh, assembly of uh, various quarks. And so that's all it is, okay? So it's just composite objects. They're not really interesting. We are mostly interested in those 18. But there was a problem that remained in the 60s. The standard model, that's the simple part, but there is all the fancy equations that come with it that describe how particles will interact and which one can go with what. And there was a major problem is that all those equations were producing massless particles. All the bosons associated with the forces were coming out as massless. But we knew that we had measured the masses of the W and the other particles, and so we knew something was wrong. There was no way to explain where the mass was coming from to these particles. In the equations that they had, it didn't work. But uh, these people came after, afterwards, but the two first ones were Francois Angler and Robert uh, Braut, two uh, guys from Belgium. And they propose a new mechanism that there would be a field that permeates the, the whole space and that it provided the mass. We'll go to that. Peter Higgs had the same idea. He was uh, working independently alone in Scotland. And uh, he proposed this uh, paper to a new uh, journal. And the editor of the journal said, oh, come on. 
you know, another useless theory. It doesn't come with any specific prediction. <sighs> Higgs was a bit bummed out, and, and, and so he said, Maybe it comes with a new boson. And so he, this time he wrote it in the paper and resubmitted it to a different journal. And then it was accepted. So since he was the first one to talk about the boson, that's why today this boson is called the Higgs boson. So what they proposed was a mechanism to explain how particles would acquire mass, and that implied the existence of a new field. We'll go to, slowly through that. Particles acquire mass by interacting with this field. So I'm going to show you how it works. A field, what is a field? It has nothing to do with that in physics. A physic, uh, in physics, a field is something that modifies the properties of the space around it. So if you put a magnet here, and then you come with an iron filing on top of it, they will all align, the little grain of uh, iron will all align following the magnetic uh, lines. And we can, if you want to do it, don't forget to put a plastic sheet, transparent sheet, between your magnet and the iron, because otherwise you make a mess, believe me. <laughs> and so a, a field is simply something that modifies the properties of the space around it. I need a few more concepts to go further. First one, mass. Mass is resistance to motion, or resistance to the sh change in your state of motion. If I st take a huge boat like this, it has a huge mass because it takes a huge amount of energy to put it into motion or to stop it. So that's what we, that's the inertial mass. And second concept we need, the one from uh, Mileva and Albert Einstein, is this equ equivalence between energy and mass. So this equation, which is the most well-known in physics, E represents the energy, M the mass, and C square is the square of the speed of light, and it's like the exchange rate between energy and mass. Here, you, I've never seen so many exchange uh, places for money, and uh, here in Budapest, it's, uh, in, in uh, Belgrade, it's very, very simple to change money, I like that. But here, the exchange rate between uh, energy and mass is always fixed, C square. On the street, it varies about uh, every day. So I have, it's like with money. I have dinars and I have euro, but both are money. And here it's the same. It's the same essence, but here we can look at uh, mass like congealed energy, like frozen energy. It's the same. And you can take energy, that's what we do at CERN, and we transform it into mass and we create new particles. Or that in a nuclear reactor, you take mass and you transform it into energy. So that's an equation, Mileva's equation I use every day in my work. And the last thing that I need is the energy conservation. Energy, we can look at it as a fluid. Energy can take different uh, form, but the total amount is always conserved. So imagine that I have two containers and here a container full of a fluid. When the container is full here, I can pour a bit of my fluid here in the kinetic energy uh, container that's associated with motion, and a fundamental particle can also have energy in the form of its mass. So those are the two ways a particle can have energy. It's either in its mass or kinetic energy. But whatever you start with, you cannot lose any. You cannot spill. So let's look what happened with this field that uh, Braut and Glut and uh, Higgs thought about. If we, forget about them for a second. For, if we have empty space, no Braut and Glut Higgs. So that was oh, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. There was still no uh, Braut and Glut uh, Higgs field. In that case, all particles are massless, and they can travel at the speed of light. But here, the speed of light, okay, yeah, we got it. Okay, to make it uh, clear, the particle goes on a straight line, and it can go at the maximum allowed speed, which is the speed of light. In that case, this particle, all its energy is in the form of motion, 
It has no mass. So the total energy is our kinetic energy. But let's move to another, uh, to a space filled with the Brout and Glert Higgs. And it's like, like the, the particle will start interacting with this field. So when this particle, uh, when this particle wants to go from point A to point B, it starts interacting with the, the, the medium around it. It no longer goes on a straight line. It no longer goes at the maximum speed. So we see its energy associated to motion is much less than it was before. What happened to the missing energy here? Yeah, that's it. I gave this talk once in Scotland, and there was a tiny, <laughs> tiny uh, girl there, and she, <laughs> her face just illuminated mass. <laughs> it was wonderful. Anyway, so that's what happened. Try to imagine it like a, a schoolyard, which is empty. Anybody can wor uh, run across the schoolyard at full speed, whatever your full speed is. But if the, the schoolyard is full of kids, well, you know, you, you'll bump into uh, everybody and you will be slowed down. And oh, there are people you know, so you'll stop to say hello. And so you're slowed down. So that's a bit what happens here. So by interacting with the field, some of the uh, particle's energy is transformed into mass. It's a bit of a mystery, but at least you have some sort of an image to understand what's happening there. I still haven't said one word about the Higgs boson. I don't know if you've noticed. I'm talking about the field. So the Brout and Glirt Higgs field, we can look at it like the canvas of the universe, the, the base of the universe. And uh, it's like the surface of an ocean. You know, you can excite the surface of the ocean and create uh, waves. And the Higgs boson is an ice excitation of the Brout and Lert Higgs field. Okay, so you can excite it. It's like, imagine that uh, I have a small aquari aquarium here in my a glass aquarium. You see it? It's full of water. You see that? You see, you see, that's it. So I'm telling you, uh, I have an aquarium here full of water and uh, put it on my table here, okay? And, but from your distance, you don't see if it's true. I tell you it's full, but if I tap on the windows here, whoops, you will see wavelets appearing. And that's exactly what we did. We went and we excited the canvas of the universe. <laughs> and it didn't put us in a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> That's the good part. So waves are excitations of the ocean surface, and the Higgs bosons are simply excitations of this field that is there. How do you go about to excite the canvas uh, of the universe? You need, uh, so to create the Higgs boson, we need to excite the, this field. How did we excite, excite the fabric of the universe? We needed a really big machine, and that was the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider is a huge accelerator, and it's uh, located on the border between uh, uh, France and uh, Switzerland. Here we see the uh, uh, Lake uh, Geneva, and Geneva is here and the Alps in the back. And so this is 27 kilometers around. And you don't see that from above, but uh, there are four large experiments built underground uh, under it. I was working on the Atlas experiment. CMS is very similar. You look at the same things as us. LHCB is more specialized. They want to know why today in the universe we only see matter. In laboratories, when we uh, work, we always produce as much matter as antimatter. So we think that at the Big Bang, there was just as much matter as antimatter created. But what happened to this antimatter? No clue. So they're trying to solve that. And Alice is trying to look at what happened at the closest moment after the Big Bang, because they are creating things that are just as hot as the Big Bang, so they can look at it. 
So CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. There are about 13,000 researchers from 78 countries. It was funded by uh, UNESCO in 1954, mostly to bring back peace in Europe through uh, international collaboration between uh, sciences. It's financed by all uh, its members. There are 23 members, mostly all of Europe, UK, Serbia, and Israel. But other countries are uh, in the process of becoming full members, like Turkey, Lithuania, Latvia, Cyprus, Croatia, Pakistan, Ukraine, and India. So lots of uh, countries are still joining. And uh, you can see here the distribution of people, the location of all the institutes that collaborate at CERN. There, there are uh, lots of them. Here in uh, Serbia, there are 38 uh, people working for Serbian Institute. But there are 48 uh, scientists of Serbian uh, nationality working at CERN, so hired by Barcelona or I don't know what. But you see that uh, the distribution, we're trying to make more of a, uh, impact here, have more people in uh, um, Africa. When we started, there was nobody from uh, South America. So it's it, their are efforts in that uh, direction. So, yeah, yeah. If, the, if they have money to send people to work at CERN, and if they have uh, universities to train people to, uh, uh, to be uh, physicists. So of course, developing countries don't have all those resources. But if I go back, uh, South Africa, there have been lots of efforts to uh, start and support the group there, as well as here in Morocco, and uh, Morocco, Algeria, and uh, Egypt. But so the, uh, a friend of mine who is from Togo, but he studied in the U uh, U.S., but he's now uh, helping with the group in South Africa. But we're trying to uh, train more people. So this uh, guy from Togo, um, Ketevia Samagan, is now starting a summer school and trying to train more people uh, in Africa. So that's, uh, there are many efforts. So you're the one who were telling me that uh, people here in Serbia were never interrupting that uh, their teachers. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, so there are four experiments. They are located 100 meters underground, and uh, there are huge caverns that have been excavated, and the detectors were built in those uh, caverns. And we build them like we build ship in a bottle. Now they cannot come out of those uh, uh, caverns. And uh, they're really big. I'll show some pictures in a minute. And we have protons in the accelerator. We have protons circulating at near the speed of light. Not right, not absolutely. 99.99997% of the speed of light. And so they, they are circulating in two different directions. And then they are brought into collision at exactly in the middle of where the four detectors are located. And the energy, it's so much energy that comes in a tiny, tiny point of space. And from that, we create new particles. And they are very unstable, and they break apart. And then we see all sorts of fragments flying out, a bit like a mini firework. Okay? And so our job then is to look at all the fragments and try to catch them all, see uh, identify what, what they were. So that was a pion. The, see, there are two quarks. That's a pion. Here is probably a proton and a neutron, and I don't know. So we try to identify all the pieces, see where they're coming from, the same point, and then we can determine what was created in the center. Here is a small animation to show how it goes. So this, we start in the tiny accelerator. We just uh, try to bring them to an energy of 1.4 giga electron volt, 10 to the 6. Then they go to a larger one, which is now 7 kilometers across. And you see we're going up to 450 GeV. And then uh, 7 TeV, so tera electron volt, so it's a 1,000 times more. And that's the tunnel that we have. It looks like a subway tunnel. And uh, protons are going in one direction and then in also in the other direction. So quarks are a bit excited. Uh, action is coming. And they're coming, one proton from one side, 
one proton from the other side, and they will collide right in the middle of the Atlas detector, produce something that will break apart, and we will catch all the fragments and try to see what was happening. And we do that billions of times per second. <laughs> it's lots of fun. And we take pictures of all that. And it's like a, a, a tourist, a mad tourist going on vacation and taking pictures like a maniac, you know, of everything. Then you come home and you have to sort them out. And that's a huge job to sort them out. So we have all sorts of techniques to try to determine which one could be interesting and all that, but still we're stuck with a lot of uh, pictures. And our detectors are made like a tin can, like a can of beans. So it's a cylinder with two ends. And we have several layers, and each layer will give us part of the information. I was working on uh, this tiny detector here at the center. It was about uh, one meter long, like this. No, uh, yeah, uh, 1.4 meter around and two or three meters long. And so this was for tracking to see where they come from exactly, to only take the fragment that come exactly from the same point. And then other layers will tell us how much energy the fragments had. And the last layer is to determine if it was a muon, because muons are uh, the only particles that can cross all the layers and leave a, uh, a trace, a track at the end. And it's really like when you have fresh snow, I think uh, I heard you had snow here once this winter. You know how beautiful it is when it's all white and all that. And then you can see, ah, uh, one uh, dog uh, went in this direction, and here it was uh, someone with high heels, and here was someone with heavy boots. So it's very easy to tell the difference between the particles because they all leave very different tracks. So we can identify them. The detector is gigantic. It has 4,000 kilometers of cables and 4,000 kilometers of tubings of all sorts with all sorts of liquids in it. And it's uh, 7,000 tons. That's the Atlas detector, 7,000 tons. It's like the Eiffel Tower in Paris. But instead of being rusted the steel, it's all miniature uh, uh, devices, all handmade and ultra precise device. It's like my uh, colleague uh, said, it's like uh, uh, Swiss watch on steroids. You know, it's just monstrous. And then it's six story high, like six, a building with six levels. And so the guy is trying to make a selfie, but useless. And so if you ever have uh, the opportunity to go and visit at CERN, don't miss a visit on the ground. But you have to go uh, between uh, Christmas and uh, March or April when we do maintenance. Otherwise, when the accelerator uh, runs, Nobody goes down. And so the thing is that uh, the, the, most, uh, the biggest question is how did we manage to make it work? Because effectively, we turned it on and everything worked. It was really an uh, amazing thing. How did we find the Higgs boson? So we excited, we, we bring a lot of energy in a small point of space. And if we, we use some resonance, no, yeah, like a, a, a string of a guitar, if you, uh, if you use a, um, a, a tune fork, and it's exactly the same uh, uh, frequency, and you put it on the guitar, you can see the, the, the chord, the, the, the string vibrating. And you can put a piece of paper and you, you would see it vibrate. So that's what happens with the, with, if we put exactly the right energy, we can produce Higgs boson and we can find them. How did we find them? The Higgs boson, I showed them to you at the beginning. They are in the standard model uh, panel. Okay, it's one fundamental particle. It's not made of other particles. And it's just like when I have uh, some coins and I go to a machine to get change. It's not that my two euro contain two pieces of one euro, but the change machine can give me two pieces of one euro. I will change a two euro for the equivalent in value, or I can change it also into four pieces of 50 centimes. A Higgs boson is the same. The Higgs boson disappears when it breaks apart, and it can produce two Z bosons, 
and each Z boson can produce two muons. So one way to look for Higgs bosons is to look for four muons in an event, one of those pictures that we took. But it's not the only way we can get four muons. We can take, it's easy, this is stuff to produce, the big two euro coin, the Higgs boson. But we can also produce two Z bosons separately with different, uh, each one with different energy and all that, and they will both give us two muons. So in the end, we would have four muons. So this is what we call background, and that's our signal. That's what we want to find, but there is one in millions of those. So it's a, a lot of uh, uh, work to find them. So the type of event that we are looking for looks like this. So imagine the cylinder that I was talking about uh, before for the detector. Then I turn it towards you. So it's the, the end plate. So we see it. The protons arrive like this, met the other one here right in the middle, and everything came out. So here it's a cut in that uh, plane. And we see particle muons are easy to identify. They're the only ones that give a signal at the end in the last uh, layer. So what we, what we did, we know if they come from two Z bosons, each Z boson had some energy when it's created. So when they break apart, they give part of this energy, the, their own kinetic energy, plus their mass, they give it into mass and energy to the muons, the four muons that are produced. Theorists can tell us that they will be distributed like this. Okay, they say so. Then they tell us also that if we were to produce a Higgs boson, and if this boson had a mass of 150, don't worry too much about the, we use electron volts, giga electron volts, because mass and energy are the same, so we measure things in units of energy. But it's just a name. So here, if, they were, if the Higgs boson was 150 GeV, all the, when I combine the mass and the energy of the four muons, they will all give me the exact value of the mass of the Higgs boson. So I would find events like this, distributed like this, from two Z boson plus an excess somewhere. And so here is what happened. We started collecting the data in 2010. Each point is a picture that we took where we found four muons. And you see the vertical bar is for the margin of error, experimental error. And you see slowly, 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 we see something, an excess appearing here. And now we are in the 2012, and we see, it's in July that we announced it. So it was not so big. But you can see that it corresponds here to what theorists were expecting for Higgs boson, which turned out to be at 125 GeV. So at the beginning, we need to accumulate a lot of uh, events because at the beginning, we don't see anything. It's only when we have enough and that the uh, error margins are reduced that we can see slowly here, an accumulation. And so, oops, I wanted to point to July. So in 2012, we were able to announce, yes, we have found Higgs boson, and God, we had a good party. That was nice. I was in, uh, I was in, uh, it was in Melbourne. Uh, uh, there was a huge conference. It was announced at CERN, but at the same time, there was a, a huge conference with 900 physicists at Melbourne, and I was there, and I was supposed to cover the, discovery of the Higgs boson for CERN. I was so excited. I was writing blogs, and f live blogs during the presentation. The presentation at CERN was broadcast in our auditorium in, uh, and I was blogging in uh, English from the right hand and blogging in French from the left hand and answering the questions from a journalist who was sitting next to me and didn't get anything. I was trying to explain to him. <laughs> it was really exciting. I had a lot of time. But when we look at a picture like that, nobody can tell us, is this a real Higgs boson or was it a Z, an event with two Z uh, bosons? So the lifetime of a Higgs boson is 10 to the minus 25 uh, seconds. So 0 0.0000024 zeros. We'll never do anything useful with that. You have to get, get, um, get up really early to be able to use something like that. 
So the Higgs boson is totally useless. All it does is that now we understand how fundamental particles acquire mass, how matter can form, which was kind of important. Otherwise, it was very difficult to, to make matter. It makes that humanity can go to bed a, a little less stupid tonight. So that's worth something. But what is really important is, is that why government, governments pay for us and our research is because when we do such a larger projects, we are forced to develop new things such as the World Wide Web, which came from CERN. And the reason for it was that we were people from 78 countries working everywhere. We needed means to communicate with each other. So that's why we started that. Given that CERN is uh, working with public money, your tax money, then it, may, it gave the World Wide Web without patent to, uh, to the world because uh, it was already paid for. But that's not the only thing. Uh, the, in the previous um, century, physicists were working on uh, uh, electrons and electromagnetic waves. Today we have uh, telecommunications and electronics and uh, computers and things like that. All this came from fundamental research. 150 years ago, Faraday was working on electromagnetism and uh, the equivalent of the Minister of uh, Finances came to visit his lab and he asked him, what are you going to do with that? He said, no clue, but I'm sure you'll find a way to tax us on it. And it's true, we all pay taxes on our electricity bill. Uh, at least uh, we do. Anyway, so all those things, thanks to brilliant engineers that have been able to put that into uh, something useful, now we have all those things. Coming directly from research in particle physics is medical imaging. All the uh, CAT scan, uh, magnetic resonance, uh, uh, um, x-rays, all those things are techniques that we use to detect particles with our detectors. So that's uh, uh, the latest one. That was announced in uh, September. And uh, this is a conventional computer tomography as it's a little mouse here that we see. So it's like X-ray, but in color. X-rays were always black and white, and now they're using different uh, frequencies, uh, wavelengths for the X-rays, and they're making much better pictures. Look at this little mouse. You, know, you, you see everything. You can also tell the biochemical content and things like that. It's quite uh, amazing. So that's the latest thing. One recent thing is this thing called the hadron therapy. Now you know what hadrons are, particles made of quarks, like protons and neutrons. In conventional uh, x-rays, uh, we're using conventional x-rays are here. We're using photons. It's an electromagnetic wave. And you see this is the amount of energy that is deposited according to the distance of penetration in uh, human uh, uh, tissue. And so you see that you deposit a lot of energy all the way and say that our tumor is here. Well, you burn some of it, but you burn a lot of healthy tissue at the same time. You won't want to have an x-ray after that. Huh? But if we use electrons, it doesn't work because electrons, there are too many electrons outside the atoms and they interact with each other and they cannot penetrate very deep. So say we have our tumor here with protons or carbons atoms, everything made of uh, hadrons, of quarks, you can tune the machine, the energy such that they will deposit all the energy at one specific depth. And so that's wonderful. You zap the tumor and you don't burn the healthy tissue like you, you are here with x-rays. So if you're ever given the chance, there are a few centers with hadron therapy. CERN had uh, contributed to build one in uh, Italy. So that's what it looks like when you go for the treatment. They put the patient here and it looks nice and asepticized. And behind the wall is what CERN built, which is a mini accelerator to produce that beam of uh, protons, tunable energy to deposit it where you want. 
have we found everything yet? Far from it. So, because there are some young people like your son there, so you, know, you, you want to know if there is still something left for you to do. Huh? Ben oui, otherwise it's not much fun. Well, in fact, what we have found so far explain 5% of the content of the universe. So everything that we see, the matter that we see on Earth, that we're made of, that we see in stars, they emit light so we know the, by, uh, 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 how is it called? Uh, you're the biologist, biochemist, uh, help me. Uh, how is it called? Uh, Spectroscopy, voyons. Spectroscopy, you can tell the, the, which elements are on stars, and it's the same things, iron and uh, helium and uh, hydrogen like here. So we know that everything in stars and galaxies are made of the same matter as we have here, and that only accounts for 5% of the content of the universe. We now know that there is, in the universe, a huge amount of a type of matter called dark matter because it doesn't emit light. And so this is called dark matter. And there is also dark energy. And we know there is dark energy because it, you know there was the Big Bang. And it goes in expanding. Huh? The universe is expanding. But in 2003, 4, some scientists, some astronomers, discovered that not only it goes expanding, but this expansion goes accelerating. How can you accelerate the expansion of the universe? It takes a lot of energy. And this energy comes from a strange source. We don't know what it is, but we need a lot of it. And it's the dark energy. And for the dark matter, there are lots of proof for it. And if you want, I can show you some after the, the talk. But we know that what we know so far is we've worked for, in particle physics for about 100 years, 150 years. We've discovered 5%, explain 5% of the content of the. So, jeune homme, monsieur, for you, you, you still have to explain to us what is this here. And there is a lot of work left to do. You too. The two of you have to work together and help us here. So, what we have explained is just the tip of the iceberg. Most of, it, of what is out there is absolutely unknown. So the particles that I showed with the standard model only explains this part. The rest, no clue. No clue what it is. So, and there are many problems with the standard model. There is no particle to explain dark matter. We don't explain the disappearance of antimatter. The fact that there are some particles that are 4,000 times heavier than others. Uh, why neutrinos have mass, that's something weird as well. It doesn't work. And it does not include the gravitation. That's all. Gravitation is always a problem. So the best theories are at work, like here, John Ellis from uh, uh, London, and uh, my friend, uh, Mademoiselle Mumu, and they are trying to find a new theory that could explain what's happening. And uh, John Ellis, when I visited him to take this picture, I asked him, John, come on, can you find a paper there? Uh, he said, I've read your paper. Oh, I was impressed. Then I said, can you, can you tell me where it is? He said, don't ask for too much. <laughs> so. Uh, People are looking for the, like the Holy Grail, like Indiana Jones, looking for that passage towards the, the revelation. What is this new theory? It is as if in uh, particle physics, what we have now with the standard model, it explains just about everything that we see. But we know that there is more than that. So it's, it is as if in mathematics, we had only discovered arithmetics. So addition, multiplication, su subtraction, and uh, division. That's all we knew. And the standard model is maybe like arithmetic is to mathematics. But we still need to find uh, algebra, geometry, uh, trigonometry, calculus, all those things. So. People need to build a theory. And I was at the Institute of Physics this morning, and a theorist there, I forgot his uh, full name, Marco, and uh, he told me it's so easy to, to make a theory, but it's very difficult to, make, uh, to prove it. So that's the problem we have now.
So there are lots of theories out there, but we cannot tell which ones are good. One way to, is to look for an excess of events, like we did for the Higgs boson, you know, a peak, something extra from what we already knew from the standard model. And so sometimes when we accumulate data, like here, they were looking at events where we only found two photons, really, really energetic photons coming out of the center of the detector. And when you put all the events with two photons, it falls exactly on the theoretical curve here, the red curve. But whoops, there was this little blip here at 750 GeV. And so Atlas shown that and the last day in December, 21st of December, before the Christmas break, but we also turned off the accelerator for three or four months for maintenance. And they showed that and they were, everybody was surprised. And then the other experiment, CMS, they tried to look for, for it. And uh, CMS in March, they also had results and they also had some sort of an anomaly there Oh my God, oh my God, people were working around the clock and the accelerator was restarted around April and there was a major conference in August, August 1st, so we accumulated data for three or four months and everybody was frantically trying to uh, analyze it and then when we looked for it uh, the next time, there was nothing left. It was a statistical fluctuation. And that happens all the time. In physics, we, have, we say it has to be five times bigger, the fluctuation, than the possible fluctuation from statistics. And so theorists get excited really, really quickly. When we published that in uh, December, some had no Christmas uh, dinner, that's for sure. And they just produced papers like Maniac until uh, the 1st of August was here. So we had 540 some papers. But some, and then it was announced that it had disappeared. But some people could not let go and they kept publishing uh, papers. And those are 554 different theories. All of them are plausible, so at least 90 some percent of them were valid. And they had all sorts of weird uh, names, you no know, dark matter, hidden sector, extra dimension, uh, new fermions, heavy of, uh, axions, composite whatever. We need an experimental result, a new particle or something, to be able to tell which one is, uh, is true. There is an anomaly right now. Uh, when we measure the W mass, the mass of the W boson, if, here are different experiments that measured it. And the most recent one, and the, by far the most precise, you see, plus or minus nine when the other ones had uh, very large errors. So this one is really far away from the value predicted by the standard model. So it's, it got a lot of people excited, but I was talking with, uh, again, with um, this time with the experimentalist from uh, uh, Institute of Physics in uh, Zimun, uh, and he told me, ah, no, nobody really believes it, that there's something wrong. And he told me, oh, they probably use a wrong theoretical input and that could uh, influence that. But on Tuesday, they, he will announce the new result that he and a, a colleague made. And we're not allowed to say anything before Tuesday, but uh, it will be interesting. So, but this, uh, this group here, they work for 10 years to produce it this new result. And when I was talking with the person in chief of uh, analysis at uh, Atlas, she told me last year, oh, we, we, it will take us years to do this measurement. This guy made it in one year with a new technique. So it's very interesting. Uh, to this day, they only use 3% of the total data available, but the data, it's not as much, you don't need many data. You just need data that is really clean and we don't have much. And so CMS plans to do a new analysis, but it's very, very difficult. But it's an interesting one. So right now the LHC is uh, running. They're starting uh, any time, any day now. They will be at slightly higher energy and they will have higher luminosity. You will read that in the newspapers. But higher energy really uh, simply means that it is as if I'm, I'm telling you there is a wonderful book hidden in this uh, library. But uh, now I'm giving you a taller ladder, so you will be able to search at least the last uh, 
uh, less uh, row of books here that you we never looked at before. So it's going slightly. It only you no, know, it will be 13.6, not even 14. And higher luminosity is that I just open all the doors of the library, and the whole library now can be searched to find this very special book. So maybe we'll ha be lucky and find something new, but it's getting tough. So let's uh, take home the message. All matter, if you can remember that, you will be in good uh, standing for understanding the basics of uh, particle physics. All matter is built from fundamental particles. And I told you there is the two quarks, up and down quarks, and the electron. But this visible matter only accounts for 5% of the total content of the universe. And the, the, the rest, the 95%, we leave that for the two of you to uh, solve. And there will probably never be any applications for the Higgs boson, but fundamental research drives economic development because we develop all sorts of new uh, technology. And it has completely changed our lives with electronics, uh, email, uh, WhatsApp and uh, what's not, uh, lots of things. Any new particle or new phenomenon that will be found from now on will revolutionize our understanding of the universe. We will find what is the theory that goes on top of the uh, standard model and that can explain a bit more. So I thank you for your attention. I have this book in, in uh, English, unfortunately. They didn't keep the title that I had in French. It's called Who Cares About Particle Physics? Tuesday in, uh, in uh, Novi Sad, someone offered me to translate it in Serbian. So maybe uh, in a year or so, it will be available in, uh, in Serbian as well. Anyway, I thank you for uh, your attention. I will take questions if you have some. Yes. Do we have questions for Dr. Pauline? Anyone? Yes. Okay, uh, so I just want to ask you, what does luminosity mean in this context? Because I'm not sure, like, I'm thinking about, you know, more light, more photons, but I'm not sure how those would interfere with the experiment itself. Luminosity so, is just, um, imagine that you like have intensity. a flashlight, okay. and it's more intensive yeah, yeah, okay, uh, okay. beam. So they can... There are many, many ways to have a more, a more luminosity. You can pack more protons in your beam, make it really, really fine, and you can, they send packets. There are 5,000 something packets, just groups of protons. They're not individual protons circulating, but groups, bundles of protons, and you can put more protons per. Per, uh, so you, there are different ways uh, in squeezing it, ma making it very tight, or making more bunches so the, the more particles uh, collide. So then you get more collisions, more pictures to sort out at the end of the day. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. How do you manage so much work? I don't understand. I, I didn't hear it. How do you do so much? Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that. How do you do it? It's easy. There are 5,000 of us. There are 5,000 of us. Everyone, you know, we work together, we collaborate, we discuss, we show people what we have done, and then we say, oh, I have this problem here. Ah, but then a friend tells you, ah, but wait, I had that problem, I solved it like this, and then, oh, okay, and you. So we work in collaboration, and in collaborations, you can always do way more than one single person. And the best example is Albert and Mileva. You know, it's not the sum of one plus one, it's exponential, what they were able to do together. Thank so you. when you work with other people, that's where you're way more productive. And we have big computers, and we have uh, all sorts of uh, f fancy electronics. If I understood this correctly, teamwork makes a dream work. Again? Teamwork makes a dream work. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No one else? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pauline. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, what is the future uh, uh, of research in CERN? Is it true that uh, 
uh, um, confirm of what found in Higgs boson uh, um, uh, can be some kind of that of uh, 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 a research in CERN. Uh, or there is another theory that can be confirmed in, 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 in CERN. Uh, uh, my question. Do you understand my question? Yeah, I understand because, uh, your question. Uh, the most popular uh, 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 discovery is discovery of Higgs boson. Yeah, so we found the Higgs boson, but unfortunately, the Higgs boson didn't bring any answer to all the questions we still have. The Higgs boson was as plain, as ordinary as it could come. It didn't have any particularity that would have told us, ah, that's the way, and this theory is probably the right one. So, it's, so indeed, uh, CERN, it's, I hope the, by accumulating lots and lots of events, rare phenomena will appear, and then we could learn something. But I suspect that we will probably get answers from dark matter searches, direct dark matter searches. Those are done deep down in mines, like there is one in Canada. And there was a very, we had a very good mine in Canada. There was a very good detector in the US, and they just moved it there. And so there are different, uh, uh, many different uh, dark matter searches that are going on, action searches as well. And so maybe there will be answers from there. But our job is to leave no stone unturned. So we, we look everywhere. Sometimes it looks absolutely crazy to look for something, but we cannot leave any possibility unchecked. So we check everything. Uh, yes, but uh, there is uh, any chance that, uh, for example, some exotic theory uh, from uh, uh, structure of elementary particles, uh, I mean about uh, quantum chromodynamics. You know what is this? Yeah, yeah. This is the uh, for example, string theory. Is there any chance that uh, some um, uh, 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 things uh, uh, relating to string theory can be confirmed in 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 search in the search in search, or, or it is not, not not possible? String theory. People have been working on that for about forty years and it never produce one single result. It's but people theory, many many theorists like it because they say it's a beautiful theory. But it's like a belief. It's like believing in a religion. And it's not real science, in my opinion. Real science is you look at the facts. And so just favoring a theory because you think it's beautiful is not quite sufficient, in my opinion. Supersymmetry is also a bit like that. Yes, and but, but researcher uh, trying to find uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, explanation of everything. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there, there, there is a theory called theory of everything, the big toe, th theory of everything, the big toe, yes, like uh, toes. For example, unification and of electromagnetic and, and, uh, and, and weak interaction also uh, starting like theoretical, uh, on theoretical level, and finally uh, 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 it will be confirmed. Uh, yes, yes, so we, we work in two ways. Uh, Mr. here is a theorist in physics, as you can uh, probably uh, infer, but so theorists can produce all sorts of theories that they think are plausible that respect all the constraints we have. And our job is to check every of them, and we do. We, uh, you know, people have uh, pro produced all sorts of possibilities, and our job is to check all of them, and we do that. And uh, on the other hand, we also just try to collect events and hoping that maybe we will find something like that no, without checking different things. And so the, uh, sometimes we check theories and sometimes we just try to see if something will appear. So, but both ways. But it's only with uh, an experimental discovery that we will be able to say this theory was exact. And the thousands of other ones were all plausible but not the right one. So theorists have a hard time because uh, they, there are lots of constraints and all that, and until we have a measurement, they cannot know anything. But uh, without theory, uh, I believe that... Uh, uh, we need both. ...experimental job uh, have no any, any, any sense. We would never have found the Higgs boson if yeah. Braut and Glut Higgs and all the other ones had told us, us what it should look like, and we tried to find it. But it was not possible to find it until we had a machine big enough, powerful enough to produce that particle. And Niels Bohr told that the most uh, foolish hypothesis is the best one. <laughs>
uh, well, there is a, the competition is really high for the, the silliest uh, theory. There are tons of them. It, you know, and that's the job. That's what they're paid for, to produce all sorts of ideas, and we check them. Yes? We, we have been developing all the techniques of uh, intellig uh, artificial intelligence. We've used that. I was really surprised. I was hearing about in, uh, artificial intelligence, and I didn't know anything about it. Then I checked it. I said, oh, I've worked with that all my life. So we do uh, use all sorts of uh, techniques like that. Uh, artificial intelligence, in fact, is just learning by experience, like we do ourselves. You know, when you have seen enough of uh, uh, like a doctor, when a doctor has seen enough uh, in a mammography of uh, tumors that look like this, you can tell that, yes, if you see another patient with such a tumor, you know that, she, unfortunately, she has one. And so it's with experience. And so that's what we were doing. We were producing tons of events, not with the detector, but based on the theory, we were making what we call Monte Carlo events. And they're produced uh, the façon, um, from aléatoire uh, uh, en anglais, uh, random, in a random way, like Monte Carlo uh, when you play uh, at the casino. And, and we were trying to produce lots of events that would look like the real ones, and then we compare that with the real uh, data, and then we can see if it looks the same. So those techniques, we have been using them. And, but now it's really exploding uh, what's being made with it. Has anybody here uh, used a uh, chat uh, GPT or those things? Are uh, you? <laughs> OK, very good. And was it good? Yes. Yeah? I've heard uh, very impressive things, yeah. Uh, yeah? Could you tell us something about, uh, it was uh, in, 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 in world media uh, about uh, a possibility to create uh, some kind of uh, uh, mini black hole during this accident. Oh. Is, is this a real uh, danger or not? No. Uh, it, it's, it's you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes one could say, oh, it was a, uh, a chance in a million, a chance in 10 millions. In that case, it was zero. It was not one chance in, it was zero, zero point zero 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 zero, absolutely. And those people were, were simply crooks who had done it. And they tried it first with another laboratory in the US, uh, Brookhaven. When they Brook, Brookhaven started, they tried to scare the shit out of everybody. And they, then they tried, it didn't, it didn't work. They did it again at CERN, and they offered CERN that they could do a safety uh, research for a reasonable price. It was just bullshit. But it was really bad. I, I heard that a young woman somewhere in India committed a suicide because of that. She was so afraid. But it's, it's, it's really terrible. It's, um, it's media sensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they were also trying to uh, get some money from CERN from that. Anyway, I thank you again uh, for coming tonight. And uh, yeah. Thank you.